Sabbath keeping is the gateway drug into Torahism. It's the issue that most often makes Hebrew roots and, and other Torah keeping theologies seem reasonable to the average Christian. And part of the reason is because the Sabbath commandment isn't as clear cut as it seems. The more we dig into it, the more we discover that some of the positions we hold about the Sabbath today are actually based on assumptions or traditions rather than what Scripture says. And today we're going to look at some of those assumptions and, and sort of myths that some of our Hebrew Roots friends have come to believe. But before we jump in, I want to remind us that none of us has a perfect theology. So as Paul talks about in Romans 14, when there's a disagreement on secondary issues like the Sabbath, and I call it secondary because it's not a matter of salvation, when there's a disagreement on secondary issues between brothers and sisters in Christ, Paul says this, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. So if a fellow believer chooses to keep the Saturday Sabbath, let's not judge them for it, right? And likewise, if a fellow Christian chooses not to keep the Mosaic Sabbath commands, let's not judge them for that either. And the good news is that there's some common ground between Christians who keep Torah and those who don't. And that common ground is this. We both acknowledge scripture as our ultimate authority. And I'll be honest, as I began digging into the Sabbath, I had to be fully prepared to abandon Christian tradition and observe the Mosaic regulations for a seventh day Sabbath, which in Hebrew is called Shabbat, if that's what scripture required of me. And from that perspective, I think we can respect our Hebrew roots friends quite a bit for making that change in their lives out of their own personal convictions. If any Christian today wants to keep Shabbat, they're entirely free in Christ to do so. It's not wrong, and it's not forbidden, and it's not prohibited. Well, except for the death penalty part. Don't do that, okay? And I would even add that for Jewish followers of Jesus, keeping Shabbat is, is in a sense, expected and a beautiful way to express your Jewish identity in Christ. So I'm not arguing against Sabbath keeping. And this is where details matter. So hear what I'm saying. I am not arguing against keeping the Sabbath, okay? What I'm arguing against is the idea taught by Torahism that observing Shabbat is required of all followers of Jesus and that not doing so is sinful and lawless. That's a false teaching that turns New Covenant Sabbath keeping from a beautiful God-honoring practice into a legalistic gateway into the bondage of keeping the entire law of Moses, which is not required of Christians. As I'm gonna demonstrate from scripture over the next few minutes, keeping Shabbat under the new covenant is permitted, but it's not required. And we're gonna get into it today, but, but I wanna make this a very practical examination of Sabbath keeping for Christians. I have another video that explores the amazing idea found in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is our Sabbath rest, and I'll link to that video below. But today, we're going to stick to the pragmatic side of the question, are Christians required to keep Shabbat? So what exactly is it that Torahism teaches about Sabbath keeping? What is the Hebrew roots view of observing Shabbat? Well, Torahism isn't a monolithic belief system where everybody agrees with each other, but in general, here's their position. And if you're watching this video as a Torah-keeping Christian, please correct me if I get anything wrong here. But I've found four common arguments used by our Hebrew Roots friends in support of Sabbath-keeping today. And together, these four arguments serve as, as pillars of what, on the surface, seems like a pretty compelling case. So first, they point to the idea that, that Sabbath was established as part of creation. Genesis 2 says, And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So the seventh day was blessed and made holy by God during creation, even before the law of Moses was given. So Torahism views Shabbat as a creation ordinance, something God established from the beginning, just like marriage is a creation ordinance. And second, 
Torahism points to the fact that a seventh-day Sabbath observance is one of the Ten Commandments, and therefore it's eternal and it applies to Christians today, even under the New Covenant. Their position is that the Sabbath should be kept forever, just like the other nine commands against idolatry and murder and adultery and so on, are still in effect today. We can't cherry pick the Ten Commandments and decide we only want to keep nine of them. And the third argument for Sabbath keeping is that nowhere in the New Testament is Shabbat abolished or changed. It wasn't swapped from Saturday to Sunday. And the New Testament nowhere teaches that Shabbat is now invalid or, or that it's ended. Which leads us to the fourth argument. Jesus and his disciples and followers observed Shabbat. And that continued even after his resurrection and after the new covenant began. And even though we see the church gathering and worshiping on the first day of the week in the New Testament, that Sunday worship never replaced Shabbat. It was in addition to it. And Sabbath keeping continued to be observed well into the early church. So that's the basic Hebrew roots case for Sabbath keeping today. And they've got some strong points. I mean, it's the same view held by Seventh-day Adventists and, and Seventh-day Baptists. And as I said earlier, if their personal convictions have led them to keep Shabbat, then God bless them, right? I might disagree with their conclusions, but there's nothing wrong with a Christian keeping the Saturday Sabbath. However, if all our Hebrew Roots friends did was keep Shabbat and then live peacefully with their brothers and sisters in Christ, this YouTube channel wouldn't need to exist. Sadly, many, well now certainly not all, but many believers in Torahism judge and accuse and challenge Christians who don't keep Shabbat. They label them lawless and living in sin and, and rebellious and so on. They preach that keeping the Sabbath isn't merely an option for followers of Jesus, it's a command, a mandate. And that's where their teachings wander away from Scripture and things get dangerous. So let's take a look at each of the four pillars in the Hebrew Roots case for Sabbath keeping. Pillar number one says that the Sabbath was established as part of creation, that God blessed the seventh day and made it holy even before the law of Moses was given. So Shabbat, just like marriage, is a creation ordinance for all mankind. And there are several problems with this theory. The first and most obvious is that the creation account in Genesis doesn't command or establish a day of worship or, or a day of rest. In fact, God issues no commands at all regarding the seventh day of creation. Genesis 2 only teaches that God ceased from his work on the seventh day and he blessed that day. In fact, the Hebrew word Shabbat isn't used as a noun to refer to a day until Exodus 16, after God had rescued Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And here in Genesis 2, we find the Hebrew verb Shavat, which means cease or rest. So, on the final day of creation, we read this, And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested, Shavat, he ceased. God doesn't need physical rest, the kind of rest that we would take on a Sabbath, right? This was a rest of completion. Yahweh was done with his creative work, so he ceased from it. He shavat on the seventh day on the, from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Why? Because on it, God rested shavat from all his work that he had done in creation. So the seventh day was declared holy, and the Hebrew word there for holy is kadosh, which means set apart or different. And the seventh day of creation is entirely unique. God actually did all his creative work in six days, and the seventh day was different. It was the day when the work of creating ceased. And notice that in Genesis 1, the descriptions of the first six days all end with, and there was evening and there was morning the first day, and the second day, and the third day, and so on. But the seventh day doesn't conclude that way. That phrase isn't used of the seventh day. And because of this, the seventh day of creation actually appears to be an endless day that was never meant to come to an end. So God sets apart the seventh day, and he blesses it, and that day doesn't end. And then in Genesis 2, the text goes right into talking about life in the garden with Adam and Eve. 
So the seventh day of creation is the Edenic garden setting for humanity, right? It's the context for life with God as it was created to be, resting in his presence. In fact, if Adam and Eve had never sinned, they would still be in the garden today, living and fellowshipping directly with God. So contrary to what our Hebrew roots friends suggest, the seventh day of creation doesn't include a command for a weekly rest for humanity. It doesn't even establish a repeating ongoing pattern of working for six days and resting for one day. Because God didn't go back to work on the eighth day of creation, right? There is no eighth day of creation. Well, some people refer to Yeshua's resurrection as the eighth day of creation, since his resurrection and the new covenant and the falling of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost all happened on the first day of the week. But that's beside the point for now. The point is, the seventh day of creation is not the weekly Shabbat. These are two different things. In fact, if all we were given by God was the book of Genesis, there would be no such thing as a weekly Shabbat. Now, the second problem with the idea that Shabbat began at creation is that there is no biblical evidence that the Sabbath was ever kept by anyone prior to God giving it to Israel in the wilderness. There's no mention of it before that. Now, when the Shabbat is finally given, thousands of years later, after God rescued Israel out of slavery in Egypt, it's linked to the seventh day of creation. It was at that point, as Israel wandered in the wilderness and, and God began providing them with manna, that God gave the weekly Shabbat to Israel. And creation week was the model on which the rhythm of Shabbat was based, not the other way around. The weekly Sabbath wasn't the basis for creation week. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the Torah says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or, or the sojourners who's within your gates. So that's the commandment. And then Yahweh explains why the pattern of resting every seventh day was chosen. For... So the reason for this pattern of resting every seventh day is because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So in the same way that God blessed the seventh day of creation and made it holy or set apart from all the other creation days, he also blessed the weekly Shabbat and made it holy or set apart from all the other days of the week. So again, the weekly Shabbat is linked to creation. It, its rhythm is based on how God created. And Shabbat would serve as a continual reminder to the Israelites that God supplies us with our every need. Right? Adam and Eve did nothing to deserve their beautiful surroundings and, and the plentiful resources in Eden. Right? Those, those were gifts from God given out of his love. And in the same way, God gave Israel the weekly Shabbat as a continual reminder that He is the source of all their blessings. They don't need to earn them through endless labor, right? They can rest and trust that God will provide. And something interesting is added when the law is given to Israel a second time in Deuteronomy. The Sabbath command is repeated. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as your Lord commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And then the fact that the Sabbath is a, is a communal event, not just personal practice, is also repeated here. On it you shall do no work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who's within your gates that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. But then, here in Deuteronomy, rather than repeating the fact that the seven-day pattern is modeled after creation, God instead commands Israel to do something specific on Shabbat. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So therefore, right, because the Israelites were to remember God rescuing them out of slavery in Egypt, that's why the Lord commanded you to keep the Sabbath day, right? God gave them the Sabbath because we humans forget all too easily 
So the Israelites were commanded to repeatedly and continually remember that they were slaves in Egypt and that Yahweh rescued them. He is the source of their salvation and their blessings, and they can rest and trust that He'll provide for them. And in that sense, the weekly Shabbat also looked forward to the time when God would restore creation to His original Edenic vision. Right? It was a weekly foretaste of how man will dwell with God in the last days, just like He did in the beginning, in the garden. And so the weekly Shabbat is linked to the seventh day of creation in that way as well. But again, the rest that God took on the last day of creation week is not the same thing as the command He gave to Israel thousands of years later at Mount Sinai. And that leads us to the second argument that our Hebrew Roots friends make about the Sabbath. Torahism points to the fact that keeping Shabbat is one of the Ten Commandments, which of course it is. The verses we just read about the Sabbath are from the giving of what we call the Ten Commandments, or in Hebrew, the Aseret Hadavarim, the Ten Words. And therefore, our Hebrew Roots friends claim, the Sabbath is eternally applicable. They see Sabbath keeping as a universal moral law, just like the other nine commandments. So by way of response to this second pillar, let me offer four ideas. First, we can't deny that the Sabbath is a bit of an anomaly in the Ten Commandments, right? Even ancient Jewish thinkers notice this. I mean, think about it. The other nine are specifically about issues that in and of themselves are moral in nature. Worshiping idols and murder and adultery and dishonoring your parents and coveting your neighbor's possessions, these are all objectively wrong for all people at all times. Right? And Scripture shows God judging mankind for all those things. But the Sabbath doesn't fit that pattern. For one thing, prior to the Law of Moses, keeping Shabbat wasn't required or commanded of anyone. So it hasn't applied at all times, like the other nine. And once the Sabbath commands were given, the only people who were judged by God for not keeping them were the Israelites. Nowhere in Scripture does God expect or command anyone outside of Israel to keep Shabbat nor does he ever judge non-Israelites for working on the seventh day. So the Sabbath command doesn't apply to all people like the other nine do. In fact, it doesn't even apply to all Israelites like the other nine do. The average Israelite kept the Sabbath by resting and not working. But that wasn't the case with the priests and the Levites who had temple and ministry duties to perform on Shabbat. So working on the Sabbath was not in and of itself sinful. In fact, it was on a Sabbath day that Jesus said, My Father is working until now, and I am working. So the moral component in the Shabbat command isn't found in the, the weekly rest itself, but rather in obedience to the command. So, yes, it was immoral for the Israelites not to keep Shabbat, because that would have been disobeying God. And it's always wrong for anyone to disobey any command of God that applies to them. But unlike the other nine, the weekly Sabbath command has not applied to all people at all times. Secondly, the fact that Shabbat was given as one of the Ten Commandments is important. But let's not miss the context for the giving of those Ten Commandments. They were given as part of the Mosaic Covenant. In fact, they're the terms of that, of that covenant. They were conditions that God put on his, his agreement with the nation of Israel. He told them, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. We're referring, of course, to the Ten Commandments in the Law of Moses. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I'm commanding you today, to go after other gods that you have not known. So the Ten Commandments were the, the foundational commands that God gave to Israel. Of the 600 plus commands given at Mount Sinai over the course of a year, these 10 are the only ones that the people of Israel actually heard audibly from God for themselves. The others they heard indirectly from Moses. And these 10 are the only commands that were written on tablets of stone by God's very finger. And those tablets were later placed in the Ark of the Covenant. The rest of the commands in the Torah were given to support and explain and expound on these ten to guide Israel in the living out of the Ten Commandments, which again were the terms of the covenant. So keep that in mind. We're going to come to that fact a little bit later. But there's another important distinction between the Sabbath and the other nine commandments. 
Of all ten commands, only the Sabbath was designated as a sign. In fact, the word Shabbat is often used in Scripture as a figure of speech that refers to the entire covenant. It's a metonymy, like when we refer to the government of England as the crown, right? So in the same way that the term the crown refers to the entirety of the English government, the term Shabbat is often used in Scripture to represent the entirety of Israel's relationship with Yahweh. The Sabbath is called both a sign and a covenant. We see this, for example, in Exodus 31. Therefore the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing it throughout their generations as a covenant forever. And there it's called a covenant. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel, that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the Sabbath is called both a covenant and a sign, but the meaning is the same, right? Shabbat served as a weekly reminder to Israel of their covenant with God and the obligation that covenant entailed, right? And this is reflected in many other verses too, like Isaiah 56, 6, which refers to everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast to my covenant. So the Sabbath signifies the entire covenant and is its key sign. Now that said, the Sabbath wasn't the, the only or even the highest command to be kept, right? Yahweh didn't promise blessings just for keeping the Sabbath. The blessings were attached to the entire covenant, and the Sabbath was just singled out as a sign of the covenant. So, so when we see the prophets issuing warnings about breaking the Sabbath, in context, it was used as shorthand for the entire covenant. These were warnings about breaking the covenant. And Israel certainly wouldn't have been blessed by perfectly keeping the weekly Shabbat while ignoring all the other commands. And this might be why in the Ten Commandments, the Sabbath is explained in much more detail than the other nine, and why it was placed sort of in the middle of the list, you know, as a sign it was sort of the glue that binds all the commands together, right? Shabbat was a weekly reminder to Israel that she was called to keep the entirety of God's commands, to observe the whole covenant. All right, let me take a little sidebar here to mention something that will often come up in these discussions. Now, we just read Exodus 31, verses 16 and 17, where God says, Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. And the Hebrew word, word there translated into English as forever is olam. So I talk about this in greater detail in my book Torahism, but the Hebrew word olam doesn't carry the, the sense of never ending or until the end of time that we find in the English word forever. Now it can mean that, but not always. Sometimes olam is used to mean ancient or, or long ago or an unknowable length of time. For example, Exodus 21 talks about a servant who loves the family they serve and they don't want to be set free, in which case, his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, so give him an earring, and he shall be his slave forever, olam. So in this verse, the, the word olam doesn't literally mean forever and ever, but rather for the rest of the servant's life, right? However long that ends up being. We see the, the same thing with the, with the Levitical priesthood in Exodus 40:15 says that the, the sons of the first high priest Aaron should be anointed with oil as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priests, and their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual olam priesthood throughout their generations. So was the Levitical priesthood intended to exist literally forever? Well, obviously not, because when the temple in Jerusalem is destroyed in 70 CE, which is an event that God ordained and Jesus prophesied, it brought the Levitical priesthood to an end. So the word olam in this context couldn't have literally meant forever and ever. It's more about an ongoing obligation of an unknowable length of time. So on its own, olam doesn't indicate whether or not the situation might change at some point in the future. And that's the case with ancient Israelite servants and with Levitical priesthood and with the Mosaic regulations regarding Shabbat. There's one last area we need to explore on this second pillar before, before we move on, and that's this. While all of God's commands in the Law of Moses have a moral component, many were also tied to a specific time or people. For example, the Law of Moses includes the following command. 
When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof, that you may not bring the guilt of blood upon your house if anyone should fall from it. So the architecture of houses in, in the ancient Near East included a flat roof where people would gather and socialize. And this command requires a parapet or a fence to ensure that no one falls off a roof and, and gets injured or killed. Now, the moral principle behind this command is that we're responsible for the safety and well-being of our neighbors and guests, and that life is valuable, right? But the command itself is bound to a time in history and a part of the world where people often had guests on the roof of their home. So if you don't live at a time or in a culture where your friends and neighbors gather on your roof, this command, as it was given, wouldn't apply to you, right? But of course, the moral principles behind it are still very much in effect. Likewise, many other commands in the law are tied to ancient Israel as a nation. This even includes some of the Big Ten. For example, honor your father and your mother. Why? That your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. So the promise attached to this command, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord has given you, is specific to ancient Israel. God doesn't, isn't giving followers of Jesus land today. Now, the moral principles behind this command are still in effect, of course. The idea of being respectful and honoring your parents. But this command, as it was given, doesn't apply to Christians today. Same thing with the command against coveting your neighbor's ox and his donkey and livestock. <laughs> These days, we're more likely to cover, covet our neighbor's SUV or big screen TV, right? But the moral principles behind this command still apply. And the same thing is true of the Sabbath command. Exodus 31, 17 tells us that Shabbat is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel. Between who? God and all of humanity? No, God and Israel. Again, God never judges Gentiles or Gentile nations for not keeping the Sabbath. Why? It was only given to Israel, which is why God commanded that on the Sabbath, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So, was the whole world slaves in Egypt? No. This remembrance only applies to the people of Israel. So how can this command be universally binding if we aren't Jewish and our people will, were never enslaved in Egypt? And since some commands, even within the Big Ten, were, were culture or people specific, it tells us that at least some of the Mosaic commands were given to deal with particular applications of God's universal, universal principles. Now, I go into detail on this concept in my video on the, the principle and expression framework, and I'll link to that video below. It might help you with this, with this concept. So it's important to understand that when God commands us not to murder today, it's not because of the Ten Commandments. It's because of his universal principle against murder, which is based in Yahweh's unchanging moral perfection. And it's been true since the beginning of time, long before the nation of Israel and the law of Moses, Cain was judged for murdering his brother Abel. Same thing with sexual immorality, right? Under the new covenant, God doesn't forbid adultery because of the Ten Commandments. Unfaithfulness and sexual immorality was wrong long before the law of Moses as we see in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I've shared this quote before, but it's worth repeating. An organization of Jewish believers in Jesus wrote this, The gift of the Torah to the Jewish people at Sinai was not revelatory in the sense of the moral aspect of it. Noah was an ish tzik, or a righteous man, and Abraham obeyed God's statutes and commands, even long before the law at Sinai was even given. Torah is not a revelation of morality, nor is the moral aspect of it unique in any way. A basic understanding of moral law is already embedded by God in the understanding of mankind. God did not appear to Israel at Sinai to present a moral code. God gave the law at Sinai, creating a unique nation. There are things given in the Torah which are unique to Israel. So my point is this. The Sabbath was given as part of the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments were given as the terms of the Mosaic Covenant. In other words, the Shabbat commands were given under and bound to and a sign of the Mosaic Covenant. 
but Jesus has ushered in a new covenant that displaces the Mosaic covenant. And I'm intentionally avoiding the term supersede because I'm opposed to replacement theology and I reject the idea that the church has replaced Israel. But I do believe that in God's plan, the new covenant is superior to the Mosaic covenant as the book of Hebrews clearly teaches. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old, so the ministry of Jesus is much more excellent than the ministry of Moses and the, the Levitical priesthood, and Yeshua's ministry is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better. So the new covenant is better than the Mosaic covenant, since it is enacted on better promises. So if that first Mosaic covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second, a new covenant. And the new covenant is not only better, it displaces the Mosaic covenant for the Jewish people, and it's a covenant that we Gentile believers have been grafted into as well. Hebrews 8 goes on to say, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And less than a decade after these words were written, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and the old covenant came to a final end. Now, God's promises to Israel remain and Israel's priority in God's kingdom remains. But the death and resurrection of the Messiah has ushered in a new age and a new covenant. And so what does that mean for the Ten Commandments? Are they now abolished and unimportant? No, of course not. They haven't been thrown away like an old pair of sneakers. But because the Ten Commandments were given as the terms of the Mosaic Covenant and were the foundation of the law, we can't simply extract them from the old obsolete covenant as is. In fact, it's no longer even possible to observe many of the Mosaic commands as originally given. The set of commands that make up the law of Moses have been re-expressed under the new covenant. Again, the moral principles behind each Mosaic command still apply under the new covenant. In fact, in many cases, they're applied in an even more rigorous way. For example, it's not enough to refrain from adultery. Under the new covenant, Jesus expects us to avoid even lustful thoughts. And it's not, a, it's not enough to simply love our neighbor. Under the new covenant, we're also taught to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Likewise, the moral principles included in the Sabbath commands are still in effect. You know, the necessity of rest and, and, and setting time aside for God, both personally and communally, and of remembering what He's done in our lives, and of remembering that He is the source of our salvation, that God is our ultimate provider and sustainer and that we are to, to tend to the needs of those around us, including those who work for us and, and foreigners and even animals. But we're no longer required to do these things in the context of a mandated seventh day rest. All right, let's move on to Torahism's third pillar on this issue. And this is where we're gonna look at some things that scripture does and doesn't say about the Sabbath that might surprise you. Our Hebrew roots friends argue that Sabbath keeping is still required because nowhere in the New Testament is Shabbat canceled or prohibited or changed from Saturday to Sunday. Therefore, the argument goes, the Sabbath command must still be in effect. And we have to agree with our Torah keeping friends that the New Testament doesn't teach that the Sabbath has ended or was changed from Saturday to Sunday. But does, but does it logically follow then that the Sabbath is still required of Christians today? No, not at all. And here are two reasons why I say that. First, an assumption of continuity between the law of Moses and the new covenant, where, where you assume that if a command isn't explicitly changed or overturned, it must still be in effect. That's a biblical approach that's incorrect as often as it's correct. It's not a given. And we see both in the Shabbat commands. Our Hebrew roots friends conclude that since there are no passages in the New Testament that declare the Sabbath has ended, we should assume that we're still required to rest from work and remain in, and remain in our homes on the Sabbath and, and not build a fire and not cause anyone else to work and remember we were slaves in the land of Egypt until Yahweh rescued us. But are we still required to gather a double portion of manna on the sixth day in, in preparation for Shabbat? 
Well, we can't assume continuity for that command, right? That was a command given to the specific group of people out in the wilderness for the specific period of time during which God was providing manna. Okay, can we assume that on Shabbat, we're still required to put out fresh bread before the Lord in the tabernacle? Well, we obviously can't assume continuity for that command either because the tabernacle, which later became the temple, no longer exists, nor does the, the priesthood to whom this command was given. So that too was a time and people-specific Sabbath command that doesn't carry over into today. Okay, then can we assume that on Shabbat, we're still supposed to make a burnt offering to the Lord of two male lambs a year old without blemish and two tenths of an ephah of fine flour for a grain offering mixed with oil and a drink offering? <laughs> well, we obviously have the same problem with this command, right? Even though this command was never annulled in scripture, we can't assume continuity for it. And this is another example of a Torah command that was bound to a people, the Levitical priests of Israel, and a time when the tabernacle or the temple was standing, right? Now, it might seem like I'm trying to be silly just to paint the Hebrew roots position as absurd, because all of these Sabbath commands I just listed are obviously no longer in effect. But these are actual Shabbat commands given by Yahweh in the Torah. And if we want to assume continuity for all the Torah commands that aren't explicitly repealed in the New Testament, then we've got to deal with these Shabbat commands as well. Otherwise, we're cherry picking because the Sabbath is a very serious issue. Yahweh took it very seriously, which brings up another Shabbat command that was never overturned in Scripture. Are we to assume continuity for the Torah commands that require the death penalty for anyone who works on a Sabbath day? Even those Torah-keeping Christians who affirm that those of us today who don't keep Shabbat have at least merited the death penalty, which is the position my friend David Wilbur takes, they'll readily admit that the death penalty can't be administered today. David's explanation is that the Shabbat death penalty only applied in theocratic Israel. So even he agrees that some of Yahweh's commands are specific to times and cultures. And here's the thing. In our desire to understand and honor the true Jewish roots of the Christian faith, which is a noble endeavor, we can't lose sight of the fact that Jesus is superior to Moses and that the New Covenant is superior to the Mosaic Covenant, right? The New Testament makes this very clear as we just read in Hebrews 8. So the followers of Jesus today have to view the Mosaic Covenant and the law of Moses in light of and through the lens of the new covenant that God put into effect at the death and resurrection of Jesus. And that brings me to my second point. While our Hebrew roots friends are correct that the Sabbath is never overturned or prohibited in the New Testament, we're also never commanded to keep the Sabbath in the New Testament. Not by Jesus, not by the apostles, not by any New Testament author. Now, I realize that arguing from a, from a negative can be a tricky thing, but the absence of Sabbath commands in the New Testament is actually a pretty significant detail. Why? Well, for one thing, it's one of the Ten Commandments, right? The other nine are actually taught in the New Testament. Some are even repeated verbatim, but not the Sabbath. And the Torah, not keeping the Sabbath, was a death penalty offense. So why isn't it repeated in the New Testament? Well, we know it wasn't accidentally overlooked, right? And we can't suggest that the New Testament authors and Jesus didn't specifically mention Shabbat because their readers and listeners already knew all about it, because their readers already knew all about the commands against murder and adultery and greed and idolatry too, right? But those things were all taught and repeated in the New Testament. Why not the Sabbath commands? I mean, when the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 debated whether Gentile believers should be required to keep the law of Moses, they decided no. And then they gave the Gentile believers no greater burden than four requirements, none of which were Sabbath keeping. They weren't required to keep the Sabbath. Now, we know that the New Testament says exactly what God wants it to say about the Sabbath. And, and so its silence on this issue is at the very least noteworthy. And in my opinion, it's significant. Now add to that silence the fact that there are numerous New Testament passages that teach that various elements from the law of Moses are no longer in effect. From the, the sacrifices for sin, the Levitical priesthood, the kosher food laws, to the Mosaic covenant itself. These are all taught as no longer in effect. 
And there are even passages in the New Testament that suggest that the Torah's times and seasons, which would include the Sabbath, weren't binding under the New Covenant either. The Apostle Paul, addressing these issues with the church in Rome, wrote, One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. So, so the law required Jews to observe special days, such as the Sabbath and the festivals and the new moons. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. So, so the person who treats a special day as holy does so unto the Lord. And the person who treats every day as sacred does so unto the Lord. And this idea is echoed in Colossians 2 when the Sabbath is explicitly mentioned. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, notice that Paul mentions three things here that correspond to the various times or cycles of the Jewish calendar, the festivals, which were annual, and the new moons, which were monthly, and then the Sabbath, which was weekly. So this passage suggests that under the new covenant, Sabbath keeping has become optional rather than required. Let no one pass judgment on you in regarding these things, right? Now, even if you disagree with some of the passages I've just mentioned, or you want to debate their interpretation, the preponderance of evidence is remarkable. At a minimum, the New Testament portrays the Sabbath in a dramatically different light than the Torah does. Something has changed. And it's in, the, in the Tanakh, remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy was a command written by the finger of God and a constant refrain. But it's nowhere found in the New Testament. Believe it or not, the New Testament includes zero commands to keep the Sabbath. So based on all of this, I firmly believe that Scripture teaches that Shabbat is not mandated for followers of Jesus. It's certainly permitted, but it's not required in any sense. And again, the question isn't whether the moral principles behind the Shabbat commands are still valid. They most certainly are. The question is whether the Shabbat commands, as given to Israel at Mount Sinai, as exercised as a sign of commitment to the entirety of the Mosaic Covenant, whether those commands are still in effect. And I don't believe they are. All right, let me mention one other thing here from, from my Christian friends. While we may celebrate the first day of the week, Sunday, as the Lord's Day, since that's the day that Jesus resurrected from the dead, and the day that the church began in Jerusalem when, when God sent His Holy Spirit on Pentecost, but the Lord's Day is not a replacement for Shabbat. And it's also not a Christian Sabbath. The fact that Jesus rose on the first day is certainly the reason that Christians began gathering for worship on Sunday. But the New Testament nowhere talks about or even hints at a change to the Sabbath day. Worship and fellowship on, on Sabbath, on the Sunday, began very early in the new church. There's evidence of it in the New Testament and, and early church writings like the Didache. But this was typically in addition to Saturday Shabbat, not a replacement of it. And Sunday worship is not commanded in the New Testament. We're free to set aside any day or every day for the Lord. And this leads us to the fourth and final pillar of the Hebrew Roots case. The argument is that since Jesus kept Sabbath, and his apostles and disciples kept the Sabbath, even after his resurrection and the new covenant had begun, therefore all Christians should keep the Sabbath. And this is really, in my opinion, the weakest of the four pillars. So what common thread can we see in Jesus and his apostles and his disciples who kept the Sabbath? Well, they were all Jewish. As we just read from the Torah itself, the Sabbath was given as a sign between who? Between Yahweh and Israel, right? Not between God and all of mankind. It was a covenant given specifically to set Israel apart from the other nations. Galatians 4 tells us that Jesus was born under the law. He was Jewish and subject to the law of Moses, which required the keeping of Shabbat. In other words, Shabbat is a uniquely Jewish institution. So if you're not Jewish, you've never been expected or required to keep a Seventh-day Sabbath. And I've got a video on the relationship of the Gentiles to the law, which goes into greater detail on this. I'll link to that below. But here's the point. Jesus himself kept Shabbat because he was a Jewish man who lived his life under the Mosaic Covenant. 
So if you're not a Jewish person under the Mosaic Covenant today, then you don't need to keep Shabbat. And on the other hand, under the New Covenant, the Sabbath was never forbidden and it, was never, it never came to an end. So of course his disciples and apostles kept the Sabbath. Why wouldn't they? Now, because they voluntarily chose to keep the Sabbath, does that somehow mean that we're mandated to do so today? Of course not. Keeping the Saturday Sabbath is certainly permitted, but it's not required of any follower of Jesus today. Okay, so let's recap this whole thing. So, although the Shabbat command is linked to the creation account in Genesis, the commandment itself to observe a weekly Sabbath wasn't actually given until the Law of Moses. And while the Sabbath was given as one of the Ten Commandments, it was specifically tied to the Mosaic Covenant and the people of Israel. Even our Hebrew Roots friends admit that not all Sabbath commands in the Torah are valid for Christians today. And while the moral principles behind the Sabbath are still in effect, they're no longer lived out in the context of a, of a mandated weekly rest. In fact, the New Testament nowhere commands anyone to keep Shabbat. And as we saw, passages like Romans 14 and Colossians 2 indicate that Shabbat is optional for followers of Jesus, not required. The Apostle Paul writes, don't let anyone judge you about those things, which is why we see Yeshua's disciples and apostles keeping the Sabbath even after the New Covenant began. It's permitted, but it's not required. The weekly Shabbat was given at Mount Sinai to the nation of Israel, and it's a number of things. It's a reminder of God rescuing Israel out of slavery in Egypt. It's a sign of the entire Mosaic Covenant. It was a gift given to Israel that pointed them to the ultimate rest that God's people will have with him when he redeems all creation in the last days. And in that sense, as a gift and a remembrance, celebrating the Sabbath today is a beautiful thing for Christians to do, but it's not mandatory or required in any sense. Thanks for watching. Shalom.